This is my experience. It does not say the truth about all people of all cultures. I'm a mother, artist, facilitator of people who are deaf, young people with various needs, taught people with Parkinson's, dementia and seniors. I'm also a social worker and a counsellor here at Radford College. I've been asked to speak this evening regarding my experience working in detention centres with people who are seeking asylum, both in Darwin on Christmas Island from 2010 to 2013. Back then, I was teaching dance and drama, employed by Serco, the external service provider for Australian detention centres. I was teaching both in family detention with women and children and in the men's detention centre. Tonight, I'm going to focus on the time spent working with families. My passion is and has always been merging the arts, health and social justice into my work. Working with asylum seekers was the perfect opportunity to incorporate all of these. Looking back, I experienced a great sense of privilege in working with this community. Back in 2010, I had two children of my own, my daughter Chloe, who turned five on the island, and my son Hugo, who was three at the time. Due to the Labor government in at the time, community detention was introduced, which allowed some families to live on the island in community. One family became our next-door neighbour. Neighbours, a Sri Lankan Tamil family, mother and father, and their two children who attended the local school in Kindy. The Sri Lankan parents would would go up to the family detention centre on the hill with all the other families during the day. In the afternoons, the kids, including my own, would come back to the houses and play together. My day job on Christmas Island was to go up to the family detention centre and use the sports recreation centre to teach dance to all the women and children. Due to the most of the women's um, religious requirements, we would make sure all doors and curtains to windows were closed so that the women could comfortably take their head scarves off to dance. Many of these women and children came from Afghanistan, Iran, Sri Lanka, Vietnam and Iraq. They often would tell me about their long journeys from where they had come from and how they had eventually ended up on the boats from small fishing villages in Indonesia. They had been told to throw away any birth certificates and identi- identity papers away before the journey. This made it so much harder for them them when they arrived on the island and for the immigration officers to identify who they were, their age and where they were from. This ended up making the waiting time to get asylum far longer than anticipated, forcing them to live in transit, which for some was up to five years or more. I had opportunities to speak to the people smugglers crew when I would sit down with them when they would ask me for cigarettes. They were segregated from the people seeking asylum in different sections of the camp. Some were as young as 15 years old, Indonesian boys from poor fishing villages. Their fathers had been fishermen in Indonesia, but due to the deterioration of the environment, they could no longer make a living from fishing in the waters, which they had fished for decades. The water was empty of fish. This forced the fishermen and their sons to find other employment. Some men, young men, would tell me that they were prepared to sacrifice a year in jail so that families could eat despite the dangerous voyage they would take. Some were aware of the dangers of the sea, but all knew, but all knew the dangers their families were facing. Survival. Most young men were forced to make the trip across the sea and on arrival to Christmas Island were detained for up to a year before they could go back to their families. Some told me that $10,000 for the trip was worth the year in confinement. Others were forced by their families and did not have a choice due to the lack of work in their home villages in Indonesia. It's worth noting considering that they didn't really know what they were signing up for. When I worked with the mothers and children from the boats, they would tell me stories of what they were trying to escape, including human rights abuse, war, religious regimes, and for some escaping violence due to sexual preference. I also met and taught unaccompanied minors, under 16-year-old children, 
who came across by themselves without parents and were told by their parents that they could only afford one boat ride. They would give, they wanted to give their child a better future, so would often send them on their own or with a sibling if they could afford it. This was terrifying for these young people, and some were young as eight years old, but many of the families on the boats would take them under their wings to make sure they were okay throughout the journey. One of the assumptions I made when working with people seeking asylum was that they would all get on with each other, with little conflict due to a similar experience and a similar common goal for a safer life. However, this was not always the case. I remember in my dance classes wanting to pair up the women and children with others of the same age, but different backgrounds. This proved to be a struggle at the beginning as they were biased against each other. Some countries were at odds with each other historically and culturally. Given that many of these women and children would get asylum status, I took this as an opportunity to loosen the barriers, borders between each other. I did this by getting the women to teach the other women their own traditional movement from their own culture. This took time and trust. It always fascinated me that they would laugh and enjoy the other woman's company and dance experience, but as soon as the doors opened, the open, the, the groups would divide and go their separate ways back into the camp. I remember a woman insisting she would not dance with her partner I had paired her up with. As the other woman, she said, would have been her gardener, cook or maid and would not have interacted in such a way if they were back home in their own country. My mission had been to break down barriers but was coming up against years of entrenched, entrenched beliefs and value systems going back generations. Obviously, these challenges do exist everywhere. I remember vividly getting yelled in my face after a class as I got the interpreter to, entra to translate what the women were so upset about. I soon learned how deep these beliefs and value systems with this particular mother. I had been teaching both her daughter and son in my class. I would bring them treats after my class to hand out. However, this, this one day, the young boy, the mother's son, had been jumping in and out of the window. So I had chosen him to come up last to choose a treat. His mother was so upset with me that I had not chosen her son before her daughter to come up to, to choose a treat. I still had so much to learn. I then decided to teach my class from a different perspective. My approach was to explore inclusion through movement. This led to great discussions around equality and equity and what might be expected of both girls and boys in the school system and men and, women in, uh, men and women's role in Australian society. My assumption again was tested when it was some women's belief that the males should dominate in society and the women's role was in the home only. I continued to learn about cultural differences. Back in 2016, I was taking my dog to the park just down here in Belconnen. And suddenly I heard some young people screaming my name, Gretel, Gretel. I looked around and it was children from Christmas Island, detention centre running towards me. They had been resettled here in Canberra. And a couple of the younger children I was introduced had been born in detention when I was working there. They told me that a few of their families from the time on Christmas Island had been re relocated to Canberra and they were loving their new life. They told me how much safe they all felt. The children and teenagers reminisced how they used to dance in a large circle with me with the blinds closed. They fondly remembered being taught movement from different cultures that they may otherwise never had experienced. We had created a sacred circle which was safe enough to risk something new. No beginning, no end, but a circle to heal. We had the power to change within this circle. We needed not only to heal ourselves, to, but to heal Mother Earth. The environment they had all come from had been destroyed for them in one way or another. It did not matter what cultural background, values and beliefs we all had. We all shared this, in, this common knowledge. We were mothers, daughters, sisters, 
sons, brothers, upon the same mother earth, under the same father sky.
that it is the mud of this earth that makes up the clay of their body. And it is to this earth that they belong. Thank you.